Yes, NMR and MRI at the scale of single cells using quantum diamond sensors. Um, you may have heard of quantum computing, quantum communication, quantum sensing, these sorts of technologies that might be useful someday. Uh, the particular platform I'm going to be telling you about, Diamond, it's an industrial grown diamond with certain atomic scale defects in them, known as nitrogen vacancy. Color centers is one of the more mature of those quantum technologies and starting maybe to do some useful things in physical sciences and a little bit in the life sciences that I'm going to tell you about today and a little summary of the of the these ND diamond or quantum diamond sensors and how they are in some ways the best of both worlds. You'll see shortly what I mean by that. And as we've already heard emphasize you, this is uh, much what Dimitri said, of course, uh, conventional MRI probes macroscopic samples and uh, is influenced by nanoscale and micro scale or mesoscale effects. And in our, with our technology, we can use individual NDs a few nanometers away from the diamond surface to be able to probe at the nanoscale and then dense ensembles of NDs, many of them now, that might be a micron thick layer at the diamond surface to be able to do sensitive measurements uh, of uh, things that are at the individual cell scale. That's what we're uh, aiming to do. Using NDs inside of diamond, these nitrogen vacancy color centers as sensors, it's about a 15 year old field. The first papers were published in about 2008. It's now become one of the more mature and widely used technologies. You might think there's a platform quantum sensor. I list here several of the highlights uh, in, across many fields. These are just the results that my group and collaborators have, have worked on. And there are dozens of groups around the world, mostly physical scientists, of course, who are now using this platform quantum sensing technology for a variety of applications, some of which have gotten mature enough that there's a beginning commercialization for navigating vehicles. And I'll talk about microscopy techniques that can be used in the physical sciences, earth and planetary science, material science, that kind of thing briefly, and how that same sort of technology might be adapted to things that you all care about. Um, there are some life science applications that are being commercialized. In this case, it's a company I started called, or co-founded called QBTI. It does immunomagnetic labeling of biomarkers. So little magnetic nanoparticles that can label biomarkers and then you can easily see those magnetic signals and the labeling is necessary to give a distinct magnetic signal so the unlabeled uh, particles don't give you the signal. And so you can distinguish and just uh, take images as you see here and the dipoles that you see red and blue are indicating individual biomarkers and count them, that sort of thing. That's a relatively simple version of it. And there's a clinical tool that's now in hospitals for, for testing, for diagnostic assays and things like that. Uh, in the case of the focus primarily of this community in this talk, Doing NMR and MRI at the scale of individual scale of individual cells and even molecules, proteins, we've been able, as I'll tell you, to get to the point where we have good enough spectral resolution. We can see J couplings and, and uh, chemical shifts and the things that the NMR spectroscopists care about. We have good enough spatial resolution, but there's still a lot of work to do to make everything integrated well enough to be useful for the life science community. So it's still a work in progress, just heads up. Uh, similarly, in neuroscience, We've been able to uh, detect single action potentials firing in whole animals, simple animals like worms and squid, non-invasively, so nothing's sticking in. It's the magnetic fields that come from the action potential currents a millimeter or so away outside that animal. And you can get the signal noise slightly better than one uh, single action potential det detection. So there's promise there too for improved MEG and MCG and those sorts of tools, but the sensitivity will still need to get better it's still a work in progress, not the focus again of this talk, but there's a variety of ways in which the technology hopefully over time will be relevant to, um, to biomedical applications. So this is what I mean though, by the best of both worlds, these defects as I, that I'm telling you about, these nitrogen vacancy color centers, they have near ideal quantum behavior, kind of like atoms, quantized energy levels, optical properties, electron and nuclear spin, et cetera, but they're hosted inside a robust solid. And at room temperature, you can get quantum behavior, not in a cryostat, not inside a vacuum chamber, but in a solid that you can shape into a variety of different um, profiles and put out into the real world. So it can have high ha impact applications in the research world. Now, this little video shows you a chunk of diamond uh, with many NDs in it, so a high density of them being illuminated with a green laser pointer. And this is what NDs basically do. They absorb green light and they emit red light, fluorescence. That's the detectable. It's optical photons we're detecting, which 
for an MRI point of view is good. We can get to the uh, close to the optical photon shot noise limit here, which gives us pretty good sensitivity. The NV itself, shown in this cartoon, that's the, those gray balls are carbon atoms in a cartoon of the, the lattice of diamond, the solid state lattice of diamond. Two neighboring carbon atoms can be replaced by a nitrogen next to it on the periodic table. It's favored to go into inside of diamond and a missing carbon or a vacancy. Now these occur naturally. If you dig diamonds out of the ground, occasionally you find one of these color centers. They're called color centers because they give color, pink color in this case, pink diamonds would have many of them. But we can grow and fabricate diamonds to suit our needs with the NVs at the density and the, or, or the location inside of the diamond that we want. Right? There's a localized electron cloud that's trapped within that carbon uh, uh, lattice inside of the diamond. And, the, and it interacts very weakly with the electronic excitations that are possible within the, the diamond lattice. So for the physicists, the uh, valence band and conduction band in, in the solid has a large band gap. Energetically, the NV sits approximately in the middle. So it's largely decoupled from the electronic excitations. Yes, the NV can be affected by things like uh, phonons inside the lattice a little bit. And that's why it emits red light and absorbs green. Yes, if there are impurities inside of the diamond, it can shorten the T1s and T2s of things like the electronic and nuclear spins. But it's, it's a remarkably good behavior, even at room temperature, in terms of long T1s that could be milliseconds, right? And these are an electronic spin. And T2s that can be close to a, a millisecond. Electronic spin or room temperature solid. Right? And so we're going to be, again, let's emphasize this, using the spins of the NVs to detect spins when we want to do NMR nuclear spins. So it's the electronic spin of the NV, quantum numbers S equal one here, and the, and the nuclear spin, depending on which isotope of nitrogen you have, is I equal one or one half. So is this, that is going to play the roles for our, as our detectors. And it's this ability to optically excite and read out optically that gives us good signals. In the world. So it's like an atom, as I said before, held in an inert solid, has quantized energy levels like an atom would have. It's a single photon absorber and emitter, like an atom would be. It has electronic and nuclear spin, as I've emphasized. It operates under ambient conditions. You can also make it cold. You can take it well above room temperature. You can put it into high pressure, high radiation environments. So some of the applications you may not care about that other people do are about taking the diamond into extreme environments and do sensing. And the intensity of the red light is the measurable, as I mentioned, is a sensitive probe because the energy levels move around like they would in any, almost any atom with magnetic fields. It's the same on chip with electron, electric fields, temperature, pressure, et cetera. So with the right experimental protocol, you can measure all those things. And sometimes you can measure them simultaneously. In one and then you can have various platforms or various profiles of the diamond. It could be a nano diamond with NVs inside. And so people have done measurements in which the nano diamonds are put inside of living, simple living creatures. You make optical measurements inside of uh, C. elegans, for example, and measure the temperature in different regions of an animal and under different physiological states or altered physiological states and learn about cell development, things like that. You can have one NV just a few nanometers away from a, uh, on a diamond nanopillar that use an, a piezo-based scheme to scan over the surface and measure all sorts of interesting things. The condensed matter of physics people love that. You can have a bulk diamond like in the video I was showing with lots of NVs, or you can have just a dense NV layer at the surface of the diamond for, this, for a wide field imaging microscope modality, which I'm gonna talk about now. So we call that wide field imaging microscope modality, the QDM, the quantum diamond microscope. And here's an example of one. You can see the computer monitor next to it, right? So it's basketball sized device. You see these cool looking Helmholtz coils, three of them, uh, three axes there. We run little currents so we can apply a bias magnetic field, typically pretty weak, 10 gauss, tens of gauss, that sort of thing, so that we can choose which of the NV axes we want to probe. I didn't mention this, I should have that the crystalline act, there are four crystalline axes inside of diamond. The NVs will equally populate typically all four axes. And the projections of things like the magnetic field along each axis gives you a different signature that you can measure. So you have a built-in vector sensor too, right? So you can measure the, not only the magnitude, but the direction of the fields as well. These are pretty simple devices. Simple is good, right? We want simple. That means it might actually do something useful. It has basically a diamond, that you can see here, that diamond chip with the NV layer, right? It's mounted, it's gonna have some microwave and RF antenna to be able to manipulate the NV spins to do your measurement. You bring your green light in, you know, often in a turf, total internal reflection mode. So it excites the NV layer, but isn't getting into your sample. And then each region of the, of the NV layer fluoresces and uh, 
and then the, and, and that fluorescence from each region is collected through optics onto a camera, and you make a real space image of fluorescence that gives you the information of the two-dimensional pattern of whatever the envy is measuring in proximity to a sample that's placed on or near the surface. Here's a, a really awesome and successful example of this technology, and it's in ancient rocks and meteorites. Hopefully you'll see in a minute why I'm showing you this at this meeting. It actually makes a little bit of sense. But what you're seeing here is a color image of this, and the colors are, and you can see on the side of the scale bar, gives you the strength of the magnetic field, the static magnetic fields here that are coming from different objects in this thin slice of rock. This rock is very interesting because it has small things inside of it called zircons, which through isotopic analysis, they know that some of these zircons can be more than 4 billion years old. They're little flotsam and jetsam left over from the early Earth's crust. You can also have ones that are like three and a half billion years old or three billion years old, that sort of thing. Often they will have iron grains inside of them, a few micron sized grains, which have very high Curie points. Again, for the physicists know what that is. That means the temperature at which the magnetization would get reset. So high a Curie point temperature that it's very likely that during all the billions of years since that zircon was formed and that grain cooled down and, and, and solidified and got a magnetization, it's never had its magnetization reset, which means if you can measure the magnetic field to determine the magnetization of these through several of them, it's a time machine. This QDM kind of looks like a time machine. Some of these kids identify. It's a time machine that's telling you about what the Earth's magnetic field was billions of years ago in certain locations. And that community is very interested in figuring out understandably, the history of the Earth, including what the geodynamo was doing as a function of time and position, even more wild than that, is that meteorites sometimes fall to the Earth, big enough ones, they get hot on the outside, but the inside remains cool, and they know from isotopic analysis that these things are leftover material from before the planets formed in our early solar system. And the same sort of analysis done on the meteorite slices can determine what some of the magnetic fields were in a swirling plasma dust disk around the proto-sun while our solar system. And over the last 10 years, the state-of-the-art measurements of these sorts of things have been done with QDMs. It really revolutionized that field as to what they could do because of that. Previously, their field of view was about a millimeter. The best field of view or the best resolution, excuse me, best resolution was about a millimeter. Uh, given by squids, not squid the animal, of course, but squids superconducting quantum interference device, a magnetometer. It's a cryogenic magnetometer, has a little loop, and they don't want to change the temperature of the rock because it'll change the magnetic properties. So the smallest you can make the loop and the closest you can get the, the squid without cryogenic issues is about a millimeter. So you have a squid uh, resolution pixel of about one millimeter, which means you are mixing together and confusing signals of interest with signals not of interest. If you just took an, an, uh, an averaged value of the magnetic field in this region, you couldn't do your science properly. They needed better resolution. They needed the right sensitivity. They need the wide field of view from the QDM to be able to see things in context. Why do you care? Look at the numbers there. It's very similar to the challenges that you've heard you all face with about a millimeter resolution in MRI and lots of interesting stuff going on on smaller length scales. What we hope to do, we haven't done yet, is provide an NMR spectroscopic image of samples of interest to you that can have this micron, even slightly better than a micron spatial resolution, several millimeter field of view. So you can study tissue microstructure directly to help advance your field. So Roger Fu, who's an earth and planetary science colleague of mine at Harvard, and I founded a company called QDMIO that makes these quantum diamond microscopes. We sold a bunch of them. For example, one is to be delivered soon to go into the lab of NYU physics professor Javad Shabani. He cares about it for material science. So possibly we could develop other QDMs optimized for what you all care about. Talk to some folks, maybe there could be a QDM user facility or something in NYU, the right kind of thing is a physical scientist want their type, different types that be useful for uh, biomedical people. We'll talk about that later, but that's this is what we're doing. There already is, for example, a user facility at University of Minnesota for the rock people. They have QDMs along with uh, other tools that they use to assess um, and study their field of paleomagnetism and, and other, other properties in rocks. It's at the Institute for Rock Magnetism at the University of Minnesota. All right, so now let's get to the main topic, which is using these NVs 
to do as NMR and MRI probes, small samples. And let me give you a quick overview of what's been accomplished over the last not quite a decade. First demonstration that might interest you was back in 2016, published in Science. We used a single shallow NV to detect the NMR signal from an individual protein. Right? It's the only technology I think that's ever done single protein NMR. Uh, there was a key 10x SNR boost via quantum logic, similar to the scheme I'm going to I'll, I'll describe to you in a, in a few minutes when we, when we move to the single uh, the, the, the micron scale. However, it was not useful scientifically. It was a demonstration. You could detect the signal, but it wasn't useful. It had, this is, these are kind of spectra, very broad kilohertz, 10 kilohertz scale line widths uh, because of the, and very poor overall spectral resolution. You could barely detect a signal and uh, it wasn't very useful. Why is the line width so broad? The protein is tethered to the surface of the diamond, which perturbs it. The sequences that, and the measurement techniques we were using then at that time, didn't even have the ability to do better about a kilohertz spectral resolution We've since, since improved that. You have very inefficient matching. Occasionally you get one protein labeled next to one NV and you get your, your, uh, your data after hours of signal. <clears throat> it's not scalable, it's not useful. We are working to improve this, making little nano wells that can store the proteins in a more uh, ambient conditions and or other molecules that we want to sense and have several of the NVs, not just one, so we can boost the signal noise, get the, uh, uh, the signal averaging time way down. That's not what I'm focusing on in this talk, but work continues in that direction. Instead, at the individual cell scale, meaning scale of about 10 microns, I'll just tell you the course of improvement we made over several years. We now, we, this, this course demonstrating in, the NMR with NVs in, in, in little puddles of liquid, not in cells yet, got us hertz in absolute units, hertz resolution, so we could detect J couplings and, um, and chemical shifts well, and about million, one millimolar sensitivity. So this plot here shows sample volume on the x-axis with small samples to the left and the number limit of detection in nanomoles per root hertz. That's what's your limit of detection in, in absolute amounts of stuff, right? And the pink rectangle is kind of like the volume of an individual cell, a typical cell. And at the upper limit, that's what the water concentration, the signal you get um, and the number of limit of detection just in, in let's say, uh, protons in water. And as you get more and more sensitive, you could get less and less concentrated solutes that you'd be able to detect, right? And over the course of several years, we first showed we could get into the, that, that small volume single scale, cell scale spatial resolution, get the spectral resolution that we wanted, and then improved the performance with a series of, of techniques. So that, for example, we can see in this case, J couplings in, in a particular uh, label form of pyridine using hyperpolarization gave us a big sensitivity boost, and we could go down and see about one millimolar concentration sensitivity. That work was collaborative with Matt Rosen and Thomas Tice, who helped us a lot on hyperpolarization techniques. Subsequently, we em employed a quantum logic technique to get a significant boost in SNR, which takes us down into probably the little bit better than 100 micromolar sensitivity that we're working on doing the NMR demonstration now. So this, this data was not using actual NMR signals. It was broadcast signals that mimicked NMR signals before we go and actually do the NMR uh, measurements ourselves. So what is this quantum logic technique? Remember the NV has an electronic spin and a nuclear spin. It's the electronic spin that's very sensitive to the environment. The nuclear spin is weakly sensitive to the environment, just like Zeeman shifts for uh, electrons are about a thousand times larger than for nuclear, right? So you make the measurement with the electronic spin of the NV that the measurement of whatever you're trying to measure, like an NMR signal, that's essentially an accumulated phase that you want to measure out and measure optically. The normal thing you do is just to make that measurement, put a pi over two pulse on to project the electronic spin of the NV along its longitudinal axis and then read out the intensity of the red light. Remember, that's the measurable. And that the, you know, spin up versus spin down for the electronic spin gives you a high and low uh, intensity signal in between would be intermediate. So that's your measurement. What we do here, start with that measurement, Accumulate that phase in the electronic spin. Then there's a something called a swap gate that they, it's a, it's a quantum information protocol, which can move that uh, information onto the nuclear spin. Then you put on what's called a CNOT gate, which entangles the electronic spin and the nuclear spin. They're now basically information is shared between the two. And then you read out the electronic spin. But that does not 
um, eliminated all the information that was on the nucleus. So you now can re-entangle the electronic and nucleus spin and read out again and again and again and repeat this process thousands of times, limited by how well you put on your gates and ultimately by the T1 relaxation of the nucleus spin. This means one measurement, thousands, you know, one measurement of the thing of interest, thousands of readouts, which greatly boosts your signal, reduces your shot noise, photon shot noise, and gives you remarkable, in this case, like 30x, greater than 30x SNR enhancement if you do it. So this is actual, it's what's called a quantum non-demolition non mechanism. Actual entanglement doing something almost useful, we're not quite there, haven't done it, but, but almost useful, right? Getting there, so that's good. Quantum hype is not all hype, maybe. So in development, we're now making a QDM, quantum diamond microscope, to do NMR and MRI. Biocompatible system, real space imaging, right? On that microscope images like with the rock. Can you do case space? Yes, we've demonstrated that too. And remember, when you put gradients on, uh, and you're not just, you can use the gradients not just to encode information in the nuclear spins you want to read out, but also in the electronic spins of the NVs, which are your sensors. That opens up, I think, I'm looking at you, Dimitri, possibilities that we haven't fully explored, but some people want to think about the modeling should. You could do multi dimensional measurements, which are a particular case space encoding in the detector spins, and then a different encoding or some correlated encoding in the nuclear spins. I'm not sure yet whether that leads to some advantage. It needs to be worked on, but it, we certainly have used uh, gradients applied to the NVs to be able to get very high nanometer scale spatial resolution, even when we have very wide field of view, because the gradients can pick out from a thousand times larger uh, magnetic moment, geomagnetic ratio. So given gradient will give you, instead of microns, you can get down to nan nanometers of the, of the NVs. All right, we have the spatial resolution we want. We can do chemical identification, J coupling uh, chemical shifts. We can get down to just below, we believe below a millimolar sensitivity. You gotta finish demoing that. You can see it's a not it's in a box, so it's gotta be, it's not enormous. It's got electronics next to it. And that's what's inside the box. We haven't yet done the NMR um, imaging with it. That's what we're working on now. Sorry, I didn't quite get there. Dimitri, I know you wanted to buy the means. Not quite there. Instead, I'll show you something else we've done, which was because we're also using a similar, a similar system to, to for the neuroscience direction, action potential. Or can we have, we're, we're want to be imaging patterns of uh, action potential magnetic, associated magnetic fields in neuronal uh, tissue slices too. So we've been starting with phantom. So here we have a nice little fabricated Terrapin University of Maryland are the Terps, the Terrapins, that's our mascot. So we have a little fabricated wire phantom. It sits on the diamond surface. We have a QDM modality. We're gonna be running some science through there. This shows you the strength of the magnetic fields that we did a kind of like an action potential simulation uh, current pulse going through. And if you watch the little image, as it goes through, you can see that we can do this real-time imaging. So this is one run. We can do real-time imaging with better than millisecond temporal resolution. So we're imaging, bam, 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 taking uh, the images as we go along. And down, we can get below, eventually below one micron, but a few micron spatial resolution, uh, several hundred micron field of view right now. So imagine that same thing, but it's not this terrapin. You now have some interesting tissue sample, and we're doing NMR mapping real-time and spectroscopic imaging, that's where we're heading for. Uh, and uh, we hope it's going to be useful for you. So how long for clinical or preclinical impact? Maybe about five years from now, trying to be realistic. My experience tells me it takes about 20 years to go from physics lab to clinic. From when, but remember, we the NV fields got started about 15 years ago. The first of them, as I, sent, sent, uh, as I mentioned here, maybe we should have a user facility at NYU for both physical and life sciences. And I'm going to come back to that in a second as I wrap up. Um, and after that, you typically need some company to do the engineering and scaling. So we can really not just have a few special labs get their special tools, but there can be, it can be there for everyone if it's useful. So my history, now I'm going to talk a little bit about an experience I had in the past, which influences my thinking here and how we go forward. That's my experience with low field MRI and hyperprime. So I'm one of the co-founders of hyperprime with John Rothberg and Matt Rose. It was founded in 2014. Now it's FDA approved, it's used in various places. You've heard about it before, kind of everyone knows about the suite. Another wonderful work like Andrew Webb and others are working on in other groups, and Larry Wald and Clarissa and Jason and lots of other uh, and, um, 
Wu Group and lots of other great things going on. Like my, my experience was through hyper. So the physics lab demo started in the 90s, in my lab in the 90s. We built our own homebrew, you know, everything starts with something on, in wood and some tape and aluminum foil there. <laughs> and, and stuff like this. We hacked together something and we're doing both hyperpolarized gases and water. W there is for water, not walls work. Um, uh, imaging and demos. And we demoed and had a paper and phys rev letters. We showed that you could put, wrap the thing in, in metal and, and uh, still image through it because it's like two millitesla and the frequencies are so long, the skin depth so large. You could put susceptibility. Uh, this, in fact, the W show when you put some high magnetic susceptibility salts next to in A, you have a low field image, no effect. B, we took it to the Brigham and did it in a high field scanner and then a big effect. Not, none of this is really a surprise, it's just demoing it. And where did this come from? We did most of this work at an, in an astrophysics lab, right? So we, how did this get started? It got started because we were building atomic clocks using noble gases and kind of maser for a, now physics lingo again. We were doing tests of fundamental symmetry. So Mitri was talking about standard model. We were looking for beyond standard model effects which would lead to violations of things called Lorentz symmetry and CPT symmetry. The physicists will probably know what this is. It doesn't matter. It's just, is there a preferred orientation to space time? Not because you're near anything, just in empty space. Is there any preferred direction in space time that would make fundamental physical things like masses of particles or the speed of light or something vary a little bit? You know, it's assumed. The answer is no. Our theories assume it, but as physicists, we need to test these assumptions. And so we did, we were developing atomic clocks using these tools and we, we're able with our measurements to find no anisotropy to space time to one part in 10 to the 31. Right. That was our result. People have that since then done better, right? So you can sleep quietly knowing that space time is pretty isotropic. Anyhow, that we all, as we build tools to do things like this, and I'll be done soon. I see the red light. Uh, as we build tools for things like this, we think, what else is it good for? And we said, we could reconfigure this and maybe do some low field MRI. In our very first paper, we talked about someday there might be portable imagers and all this kind of fantasy sort of stuff in the 90s. And we needed some money to, to build gradient coils and buy some stuff, not some big money. And our grants weren't for that kind of thing. But there was a wonderful person who gave us some money. He was the director of the Center for Astrophysics there. His name is Erwin Shapiro. He's still alive. He's just had his birthday last week. He's 94 years old. He's one of the pioneers in very long baseline interferometry, which of course is a radio astronomy tool related to, also related to imaging in different ways, right, we've heard about. And, uh, and there's an effect known as the Shapiro time delay. So it's, if there's curved space time, uh, electromagnetic signals will be bent by it and it delayed. And so that's, but he was, said if you, there's something that could be good in some other scientific field in clinical medicine, here, here was, I forget, 20K, 30K, whatever we needed to, to uh, make it go. So thank you, Erwin. A wonderful man. The next step after that, we started building human imagers. And by the late 2000s, we had, and Andrew talked about this, we had this walk in, there's a younger version of me looking kind of like this. Uh, standing it was a system you could stand in, lie down, and be in any orientation. And it was good for lung imaging, again, inhaling hyperpolarized gases. It was cardiopulmonary effects we were primarily studying, although we did some proton imaging too. Not very good proton imaging in those days, but we hadn't yet instituted the improvements like uh, that were on our minds, but that was going to take a lot of work. Uh, how was this work supported? It was supported by NASA. The funding for many years came from NASA. Why? They wanted to understand cardiopulmonary physiology in varying gravitational orientations. But then the funding got cut in 2004 or five when George W. Bush. Uh, decided to have the Mars Moon program that they didn't put any money to, into, so they redirected it from a lot of science, including things to help astronauts. It doesn't make any sense, but that's what happened. The big steps, though, happened um, when it went to, over to the Martino Sorry, step. Please, Wrap it up? <laughs> I'm almost done. You want to hear the story or should I just end? Okay, I'll finish Keep going. All right. The big step happened when we went to the Martino Center. Matt Rosen had been a postdoc in my group and was doing the work uh, some of the work with other folks back at the Center for Astrophysics. Well, another wonderful person, Bruce Rosen, no relation to Matt, who's the director of the Martino Center, um, knew what we were doing and offered us lab space and Matt to be a PI there and internal resources to get things going. And then Matt put together a team, people like Jason were part of this team, other wonderful people like Larry Wald and others helped. And Matt and his team 
bunch of people over there moved all the equipment over and then they rebuilt everything and made it a lot better and did the sort of things that Andrew was discussing as is possible, optimize sequences, get the noise out of the system. It's not mobile yet, right? Still inside of a Faraday cage. And you could get okay brain images enough that makes, um, you say it's time to commercialize, which is the hyper. Okay. Why? Now here's another little thing. Bruce Rosen, when he was an undergraduate, had worked with whom and on what? Can anyone guess? He worked with Erwin Shapiro, also Erwin's former student, Jim Moran, who's an astronomy professor at Harvard, on VLBI radio astronomy. See all these connections? Around. And again, another person, I'm talking to people who control resources, think, you know, we, we need at times people to invest in something to push it forward. So my own opinion is for the NVs and doing NMR and MRI at the micron scale, we're about at the point where we have to go from the physics labs and get it into a thing like happened at Martinos, it could be here at NYU, where you can be mix the physicists and the engineers with the biomedical people with the right kind of team, a large enough team to really integrate everything. So you're not just doing little physics grad student demos, you can get things really to work to the point and then, com and then commercialize in parallel with that to get it out. So that's my concluding message. Oh yeah, led to, of course, hyperphones being useful. 20 years in physics lab. That's my concluding message. This is a photo of my current team outside the Idea Factory, which is where the Quantum Technology Center is at, at University of Maryland. Collaborators on the serve work listed here. Also, you know, Misha Lucan and uh, Hong Kong Park in particular have been the NV NMR collaborator for a long period of time at Harvard when I was there. Support from various agencies and appropriate discipline. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry I went long. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, for the wonderful talk and the wonderful history. We're gonna move right now to the next. Probably gonna have questions after. Oh, and there's Hyperfine people here. Let me just say, Hyperfine, a lot of work happened at Hyperfine that's, of course, essential, right, to make the thing portable, the noise cancellation schemes, the, uh, to make it efficient and all that, and, and remarkable. 